Welcome to the Unplayable Podcast Instant World Cup Recaps. Australia desperately needed a win heading to Perth Stadium to take on Sri Lanka, and they got one. Sri Lanka made six for 157 after Aaron Finch sent them in. Tirith Asalanka was good with the bat, including 20 off the last over to get Sri Lanka up to a competitive total, and it looked like they might be in with a shot. After a few of Australia's top order failed to fire, Aaron Finch made a frustrating 31 off 42. But then it was Marcus Stoinis who stole the show at the end with 59 off 18 deliveries. I'm Josh on a finger. Louis Cameron is in Perth. Louis, you described Marcus Stoinis's innings in your match report as astonishing. How else can you describe it? Uh, yeah, I mean, astonishing, um, really difficult for journalists trying to write a match report and <laughs> expecting a game to go down to the wire. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's over with, what was it, 21 balls to spare. And uh, you got to try and get it in, um, you know, <laughs> straight away so you can get down to the press conferences. So it's, um, you, yeah, those those crazy kind of finishes are, are often not quite as good for the, the people covering the game and writing a match report on it. But wow, like, it just kind of came out of nowhere a bit like the, you know, Aaron Finch was, was struggling and it looked hard to be fair. Like Sri Lankans bowled beautifully early on um, with the new ball. And the first time I think it was that Australia have never hit a boundary in a power play. And I mean, he just couldn't hit the ball off the square. I'm probably jumping ahead, mate, but um, yeah, the the upshot Stoinis just, just looking like he's batting on a different wicket. Uh, to everyone else, maybe Bob Maxwell um, was was amazing, and it was a, a bit of a net run rate boost in the end as well. Well, yeah, where do we start? Why don't we start with Stoinis's innings? Uh, he came in with Australia still needing 60, 6, 69 sorry, of forty six deliveries, and then he ended up hitting fifty nine of the required sixty nine. So it was pretty stunning stuff. Forty two runs off his last ten balls, including six sixes. And some of them were massive. Like, these are big boundaries at the Optus, aren't they? And they were clearing the fence by some way. Big time, yeah. He blazed one over cover off. I can't remember if it was one of the spinners of the quicks. I was I was looking up um, <laughs> up above over my laptop screen and um, it, it was all just becoming a, a blur and became really clear that he was going to he was going to do it. Um, incredible innings. Second fastest World Cup 50 of all time. Uh, fastest by an Aussie. Um, only 17 balls. So... Hell of an effort. I mean, he, he the the one thing that was noticeable is just like the the passion and the energy that he had. Like he was fist pumping after hitting sixes, and um, his teammates noticed it. You know, speaking to a couple of them just now at the at the press conference and at the little mix zone thing thing where um, we get to speak to a few of the the other players, um, they felt energized by him, and it might have been the shot in the arm that they needed because it, it probably was it wasn't their best bowling performance. Uh, I don't think. Um, and, and one they want to improve on uh, for the England game. Do you think that emotion that we saw from Stoinis, it was sort of like a chest-beating moment, do you think that's because um, he's maybe been or feeling the pressure a little bit on his spot? His performances probably haven't been where they, where he'd like them to be? Yeah, maybe. I mean, he did um, He did have an innings against, I can't remember if it was the West Indies or England, where he... He played – it wasn't quite that level, but it was, you know, a, a 40 or 15 or something like that. Mm. It, it might have even been the game, the Perth game back here uh, a couple of weeks ago where he, where he did it. I don't think – I mean, he did say – we, we spoke to him in the press conference just now and he said he was nervous um, and that he gets more nervous playing in front of his home crowd and home fans and, and family knowing they're all there and maybe there was a bit of that adrenaline that kind of came rushing out, but – um, Ashton Agar in the mix zone said like he's like a he's like an animal or a, a cage. There's a real animal energy to him, um, and I think we can all see it. Like as a he's um, you know he almost flips a switch between a, a really nice cuddly guy off the field and then uh, you know kind of becomes this becomes this yeah this animal when he's when he's out there. Um, speaking of flipping the switch, for those watching on YouTube, the Optus Stadium lights are just flicking on and off. <laughs> behind you um now you mentioned mixed zones what do you mean for the layman what what does that mean when you're referring to the mixed zones yeah probably probably didn't explain it too well last time um on the press conference did you did did i um so you after after the game maybe about 10 15 minutes you, you get a, a player or a coach from both teams who, who do a press conference 
and that's kind of normal standard for cricket and you know that's that's kind of normally it for ICC events they're really good because they put up a couple of extra players from each team um into yeah it's called the mix zone I'm not really sure why it's called that I think it's because they mix rights holders and non-rights holders all in together um is my guess uh but they kind of become like little mini mini press conferences in themselves so um, I found them really good to get a couple of different points of view on, on what you just saw unfold, I suppose. And so Aaron Finch's knock, 31 off 42. He was visibly frustrated and audibly frustrated during his innings, mm. cursing and chunking a lot of deliveries, plays and misses and inside edges and these sorts of things. Although afterwards he said that, you know, it was a tough pitch to bat on. And it did look like mm. that uh, the Sri Lankan quicks were particularly effective early in the power play, as you said, Australia couldn't score any boundaries. What? So what's where, where to next for Aaron Finch? I mean, he's back at the top of the order where he wants to play. Is that where it's going to be for Aaron Finch? Yeah, well, I mean, that was the plan all along, he said. Uh, and, you know, other Andrew McDonald, the coach, has said that, that they were just trying to – I mean, it does make sense. They were trying to make sure Cameron Green was um, prepared to – open the batting if, if required and you know now he's in the in the squad and that might be where he bats if he plays a game if there's an injury or and you know Finch can um, shuttle back down I, I, I never saw that as a, as a major issue um, you know in terms of Finch has played I think he's I think he's getting close to 600 limited overs games um, under his yeah, belt wow. yeah. so like what's another extra couple opening the batting leading into this tournament <laughs> Um, but you know he's not he's not in the greatest form. Like it's you know I don't think he would he would try to say he is. Um, and you could see it tonight. And you could see he was frustrated at himself tonight. Like I, it was funny you, you mentioned the audible bit. Like I didn't have the TV commentary on you know on my headphones for most of the, the second innings. Uh, so I'm interested to know what was coming through because I could just see it visibly. Like he was punching his bat. He kind of threw his bat up in the air uh, after you know mm. chunking a, a shot. Um, yeah, like not through his bat, but he kind of like threw it up and caught it kind of thing in in a bit of frustration. And, and even um, when he was fielding the last ball of the uh, the last ball of the Sri Lankan innings, uh, he kind of misfielded it. I mean, it was a tough one, but he, he you know one he should have stopped. And um, he kind of like he smashed the ground in frustration. So like it started even before he he was batting. Um, but yeah, what what was he what was coming through on the stump mark? Oh, I think there was a couple of occasions where he may have got a full toss or a half volley and he's just sort of managed to hit it to the sweeper and not really in the gap and you could hear him sort of cry out in disbelief or not not mm. so much curse words, just mm. you know, a, an angry sort of moan that might come from someone who's yeah, frustrated with their performance at the minute. But at the end mm. of the day, he was not out and he played the anchor role, which in hindsight was probably what Australia needed because there were regular wickets in the first 10 overs. Yeah, there were. And I mean, the, yeah, we, we mentioned the fact that they didn't hit a boundary in the in the power play for the first time ever in a T20, which is was actually really interesting. I remember being in Bangladesh for a five game series where <laughs> 110 was like above a pass score. Like if you got his triple digits, you, you were gonna win the game. And I would have sworn that the, the Australians would have got through a power play there without, without <laughs> hitting a boundary. So, um, I mean, it was. Uh, it's funny. There was. I remember there was a boundary in the power play, but it didn't come off the bat. There was a, a four uh, yes. buys, I think, that went between or went over middle leg stump um, that Finch Finch couldn't hit. So, um, yeah. And then Warner got out to the spinner, kind of against the it, uh, against the run of play. Like he he looked more um, settled uh, against the new ball than than Finch did. Um, and then Marsh had a, had a strange innings where he was nearly out a couple of times in. His first few balls, he got dropped by uh, D- uh, by Dustin Shanaka and then top edged another one a couple of balls later that could have easily gone to a fielder. Um, he went out and then Maxwell played a – it was a crazy innings really. Like it, he – I think he hit four of his first six balls, two all over the fence. Uh, and then Benura Fernando came on who's was bowling quickly, really. Like he was, um, you know, as quick as any of the Aussies and – had a look upstairs, got him in the throat, um, which that that looked painful, mm. and um, and then he was out. He got he got dropped as well <laughs> by by Dan and Jay the Silver, uh, sorry by the um, by the sub fielder. He got um, dropped by Ashen Bandara. Oh, yes, that's right. And it was on the circle, and then the very next ball, 
uh, Van Dara had been put back onto the mid-wicket fence and having dropped a, a, a catch he should have taken, a, a pretty simple one, took an absolute worldie on the, on the rope where he kept his balance and uh, showed all this composure to keep it in. Um, so, yeah, there, there were just a lot of things going on um, and, and it did look like it, that things were in some doubt until Stoinis came in and, and did what he did. Yeah, I think you might have mentioned Binara Fernando there. He he was the one who actually got injured in his first over. Um, he pulled up short, five balls in. Sorry, and I so meant K- Kumara. Yeah, Kumara, Kumara. Yeah. You're right. That's yeah. sorry. That's who I meant. Yeah, Binara Fernando. Yeah, but it was a fantastic catch uh, on the rope. Sort of, it looked for all money like his heel was going to touch the own, but somehow mm. he kept just his toes. Uh, his toes kept his body weight upright, and it was yeah quite a phenomenal catch, like you said. Let's just touch quickly on the Aussie bowling innings. Aaron Finch won the toss, as we've mentioned, and chose to bowl first again. Our Ashton Agar came back into the side and was pretty good. Uh, Adam Zampa out with COVID. Agar finished his four overs. It was one for 25. Mitch Stark and Josh Hazelwood both also got one for about t- mid-20s, about six mm. and over. So... There were some impressive figures there, um, but, yeah, as you said, some sloppiness in the field perhaps as well. Yeah, I think so. I I reckon they bowled well. I reckon they bowled well overall. You know, the fifth bowler thing is still a – I wouldn't say it's an issue, but it's um, collectively, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they went for a few and um, that's – that's still an ongoing thing that it's it's maybe not the strongest part of their game. Having said that, a really great bit of captaincy. You know, we've we've touched on Finch's bad form there, but um, he pulled a really smart move in the for the 16th over, I think it was, when Maxwell hadn't bowled uh, all tournament so far. It looked like he wasn't going to bowl uh, in this game. And uh, Dustin Sharnik had just came to the crease and Chareth Asalanka, the left-hander, was in. So good match-up to bowl to the lefty. Uh, but Shanika normally wouldn't be, you know, right-hander. But he, he just came in. So he bowled Maxwell, um, you know, thinking that if, if Shanika attacks him, um, he's new to the crease and he's a good chance of, you know, maybe skying one. And, and that's exactly what happened. And, and Maxwell got away with a really cheap over. So I thought that was a that was a little moment in the game. Um, you know, Asalanka then still took 20 off last over and they got up to more than they should have really scored, I thought. They should have probably kept them to 140, 150. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, nice nice move there from Finch. The three bowlers who combined for the final four, if that makes sense, Stoinis and Marsh and Maxwell, they went for um, just doing that. That's 36 runs but from their four overs. So, yeah, probably yeah, a bit. Right. And Maxwell so, was only five, right? So yeah, those that's other, right. So those other three would have, would have been the bulk of that those runs. That's right. Um, on our last episode, we talked about net run rate. Australia's was smashed in the first game. It's now back up to negative 1.55, so um, that might not sound that impressive, but it's a big improvement from where they were. And thank you to all our listeners who correctly pointed out that if you are bowled out, you've effectively used all 20 overs. So that is how the net run rate works. Next up for Australia is England on Friday at the MCG. Um, England have a warm-up match, basically, against... Ireland, that's tomorrow at the MCG, so they'll get used to the Bit harsh conditions. on the Irish, mate. Bit harsh on the Irish calling it a warm-up match. I well, I'm just no, call- hope there's no Ar- the Irish people listening. We do <laughs> love the Irish team, but I'm just calling it a warm-up match in terms of the conditions that down mm. there at the Melbourne Cricket Ground. Mm. Um, Ireland will definitely come to play, no doubt about that. But what are we expecting on Friday? It's going to be a massive crowd, and Australia desperately need to win, don't they? It's the biggest... Uh, white ball game Australia have played since the last World Cup. That's uh, that's it in a nutshell. And you could probably, it was always going to be that as soon as they lost to New Zealand. Really, um, we all, we thought it would have been a huge surprise if they lost to Sri Lanka on conditions that really suited them. Um, and you know, I think they, you know, might have underachieved a bit here by by not maybe doing it a bit more. Like I know in the end it's it's an easy win or whatever and, and a net run rate boosting win, but. Um, you know, I, I think if they'd if they'd fielded a little bit better, they they could have really absolutely pumped them tonight, um, mm-hmm. and that didn't happen. So, um, you know, even even with a win over England, we saw South Africa last year won four games out of five in the Super Twelve stage and didn't make it through. And the and the Australians are very aware of that. They've spoken a, a few times about how unlucky the South Africans were um, and how you know fortunate they were to get through and and what role luck plays in tournaments like this. So. They yeah they've just got to win against England. It's going to be really tough. They have a very complete looking team. They're in good form. They've got 
um, you know, a, they've found a, an all-rounder in Sam Curran who um, seems to be going from strength to strength. Mark Woods bowling 150 k's an hour and Josh Butler's always a problem at the top of the order. So they have to solve all these things for, for Friday um, on a what could be another spicy wicket if, if India-Pakistan has anything to go on, um, again, that you were at. Yeah, it's always exciting watching Mark Wood bowl and I'm sure it's going to be a great contest again on Friday. Louis, thanks for joining us again and we'll see you in Melbourne. Look forward to it. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Josh.